on a night when your child might choose ruin or redemption, will he, will she seek your shepherding? Will your children turn to you about their biggest shame, their worst mistakes, their most gnawing, almost destroying doubts, even sometimes suicidal desperation? Would they turn to you? And positively, will they turn to you for your counsel, for your guidance about their secret hearts, about their biggest dreams, about what they're really passionate about, about the big decisions they're going to make with their bodies, with their lives, with the course that they take? Even if you're not a parent or a grandparent, members of our church family, when friends, when other family members likewise face out of the worst of times and the biggest decisions, from crises to opportunities, are they tending to turn to you and open up fully for counsel? I mean, with the things that are so embarrassing they wouldn't want to talk with anybody else about, or with the possibilities. If they do, when they do, are you ready? Are, are you ready for the night of crisis, for the night of celebration, for the new journey, for the new season? You know, here's the truth. You can only share what is already in you. You can only share what has already grown in you over a long season. It's too late when the night of crisis hits, when the new season opens up or when the heart opens up and you're not prepared to go deep. You can only share with others what's already in you. You can only shepherd out of what is already in you. Who? Who is already in you? The good news is that Jesus fills Christians and will fill every Christian who turns to him to live by his spirit, to grow in his word to grow as an active member of brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Jesus fills Christians with neither on the one hand legalism, we're going to be dealing with that as we move through Luke's gospel, Jesus specifically calls out religious legalists, the Pharisees and others. Jesus fills us not with legalism, Pharisaic pride and hypocrisy, I, I pound the Bible, man, and I can, I can get up and call everybody to repentance, and I can, I can preach a gospel and all this kind of stuff, but you know what? I'm just a legalist. I'm just a Pharisee. Jesus speaks out against that. And he also doesn't fill us with leniency or licentiousness. In other words, pagan progressivism. Okay, so we're going to see as we move through Luke, Jesus, Jesus distinguishes both those directions, which most people tend to go, either religious legalism, Pharisaism, or licentiousness and pagan progressivism. But he fills his people, Jesus does, with his Holy Spirit, which brings wisdom and grace. So today we introduce this two-part series um, today, and then Dean's going to further bring application next week in family ministries and in parenting. Parent God's child in wisdom and grace. Parent God's child in wisdom and grace. 
as you're going to you're going to hear as this sermon develops, the wisdom and grace language comes, of course, from the totality of the Bible, but specifically today from a couple of verses in Luke chapter two, to which we will eventually turn. The God's child language is kind of a couple fold. One is to acknowledge if you're a parent and you're a believer, one of the first things you need to understand, and we say this when we baptize children, um, the child is not yours. The grandchild is not yours. The child belongs to God. That's number one. Number two, we are being positive in the gospel and covenant affirmation uh, that children and households of faith do belong to God. Now, we know that ultimately they are not adopted into the household of God's grace forever unless they are born anew in the Holy Spirit. So in other words, at, at one level, Amy, Amy and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. At one level, yes, everyone's made in God's image, so you can say broadly, well, like kind of Paul does at the Areopagus in Athens, every child is, every person is kind of a child of God generally. But, but the truth is the scripture highly distinguishes that the people who truly can call God Father now and forever are only those who are born anew in Jesus Christ. So, so both kind of both and. But that, that child language is there because we're called in the church family and with our own children to parent our children as disciples in the direction of discipleship. That's our covenant affirmation. So that's what that language is coming from, parent God's child, understand your child or your grandchild as God's child in wisdom and grace. We're going to begin by turning to Galatians chapter 6 and uh, read some words from the Apostle Paul, verses 7 through 10, and then 1 through 3. I invite you to hear now God's word. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. The, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. And then back to verses uh, 1 through 3. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. We just heard from... Paul's words in Galatians, a, a principle that runs through all of Scripture. It's the principle of the law of the harvest. God's word is very clear about the law of the harvest. And the law of the harvest gives us the judgment. You want to know what the judgment is like? Okay, the law of the harvest gives us the judgment. And, and, and how do we fill in these blanks on your sermon notes if you're following along? Uh, well, here's the, here's the answer. What you sow, that is what you will reap. What you sow, that is what you will also reap. That's what God's word says. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that same you know, product, he will also reap. But, but the law of the harvest continues. Where you sow. There you will also reap. You know, we talk about this during stewardship emphases, and the truth is those who are gracious towards God, I mean, that, that flows from a, a, a life of faith, therefore there will be great reward. You know, I mean, there's a great harvest. Those who, are, uh, who hold back from God, the, the, the opposite, 
applies. Where you will sow, there you will also reap. How you sow. In thus manner you will also reap. So those are the answers to those blanks. So let's think about parenting. Maybe they'll share about their hunting, because maybe that's where you harvest, you reap, you sow with them. Maybe they'll share about their hunting, but not their hurting. Because you're not sowing there. You don't deal with that, or you don't do what, deal wisely with that. But you know what? You need to talk with them more about hunting. but much more about hurting. They'll share with you about their sports, but what about their sexual crises and concerns? See, it's the law of the harvest here, parents, church family. What about their spiritual concerns? Now, let's just talk about sports. Sports are easy. No, no, no. What you sow, where you sow, how you sow, that's where you're going to reap. The law of the harvest applies to parent-child relationship, to friend-to-friend relationship. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But here's the good news. The one who sows to the Spirit and to the things of the Spirit, including in family, including in relationships, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let me give a further harvest warning to parents. Proverbs 22. Let's go to Proverbs 22. First of all, verse 15, the first half of that verse says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a youth. Now, most translations say child. I'm here to tell you the Hebrew there is na'ar. That means lad, like a boy who is in the range of preteen through teen heading into young adult. So the scripture itself says folly is bound up in the heart of a lad. And by the way, you could say lassie too if you want to or a young girl, okay? Um, by the way, every time you get na'ar in Proverbs, I mean every time, if you, if you did Sunday school with me, you know this, every time you get the term na'ar, foolishness is connected with it. The, the word of God seems to understand that when children are going through preteen and teenagehood, they're prone to folly. Okay, they need to be guided towards wisdom. That's part of what the Proverbs is all about. Okay, now let's, let's dial back to Proverbs 22.6. Most people quote Proverbs 22.6, and they, they read a bad translation in the English, and they read it as a guarantee. Man, if I do right with my kid, it's God's already locked in on this, man. Everything's going to turn out well in the end. That is not primarily what this verse is saying. If you actually look at the Hebrew, this verse actually is talking about a na'ar again, a lad, specifically, not a child, okay, not a broad child, a lad, and says, dedicate, just like you're supposed to dedicate a house to the Lord. Well, you could dedicate a child one way or the other, to the flesh or to the spirit. Which way is it going to go? How are you going to dedicate your child? Dedicate an R according to the way of his mouth. That's what the Hebrew there literally says. According to the way of his mouth. In other words, according to what he says, what he dictates. This is a warning primarily. If you dedicate a child and let a child wander off in what he says, if you parent him based on what he says, I just want to let him do whatever, you know, follow his heart. Yeah, the heart is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah 17. If you dedicate a na'ar according to the way of his mouth, what he dictates or says, you'll get the harvest on that, and it's not going to be a good harvest when he's old. As Richard Clifford paraphrases Proverbs 22, 6. Let a youth do what he wants and he'll grow up to be a self-willed adult incapable of change. Proverbs 22, 6. Let a youth do what he wants and he'll grow up to be a self-willed adult incapable of change. When he's old, he won't depart from it. Now, let's talk about reality with us as human beings. 
God creates us as we are, and we know that our primal or animal response, we're not supposed to stay there, we're not supposed to live there, but our primal or animal response to stress and fear is what? Everybody here ought to be able to fill in these blanks, right? One and two. What, 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 are, the, what are the responses to stress and fear? Number one, fight. If you've ever dealt with young people, you know that that's a possibility. If you've dealt with old people, I know that's a possibility too, by the way. Fight. Or what's the other one? Come on, fill in the blank. Flight. Now, you've got to understand this. Who's going to be the adult in the room when fight or flight mode are in super hyper mode, okay? Is dad or mom also going to be in fight mode? Probably not a good combination here, right? Remember parent and wisdom and grace, okay? Uh, let me just also say this. I learned this in, you know, when I was doing counseling at the veterans hospital when I did my chaplaincy when I was in seminary. Defensive responses to traumatic events, there's three of them. Three classic bad moves, fragmentation, fragmentation, dissociation, or three, and you get this a lot of times with teenagers, isolation or alienation. That's the traumatic events. So here's our calling, to grow, share, and guard in wisdom and grace. Galatians 6, verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... Did you hear that? Any transgression. My child, I don't know how to deal with this. Yes, I know. Any transgression. Parent in wisdom and grace. You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Parent God's child in wisdom and grace, including when, number one, mistakes happen. Now, if there's somebody in this room who's never made a mistake, I really want to speak with you afterwards, because I probably need to get you into counseling, actually, if you think you've never made a mistake. Mistakes are going to happen. Mistakes will happen. If you say, my child never makes a mistake, I really need to get you in counseling. Man, we need to head you in another direction on parenting. Okay, mistakes happen. Misunderstandings hit. But we are to parent God's child in wisdom and grace when misunderstandings hit. And third, parent in wisdom and grace, when a child is in a new stage of life. Mama, you can't keep him at three years old forever or five years old forever. When he is at certain stages, he's becoming a man. That's a, that's a different kind of parenting. Dads, too. And dad becomes more important as some of these stages move on. And, of course, all this applies to other relationships, too, when your spouse is in a new stage of life. Well, I wanted you to be like when we were 23 years. I said, look, I don't, she's not 23 anymore. You're not 23 anymore. Other members of the family. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. Do you believe this? you believe God? You've got to play the long game here. If we do not give up. So then, as we have every opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are of the household of faith. And if they're in your house, in the household of faith, double down on this. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. All right, now we're going to turn to, as we move through Luke uh, chapter 2, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 2. Uh, picking up where we left off last week, our last verse, and Last week's sermon was verse 39. So remember, this is when Jesus is 40 days old. Um, His mom has been purified at the temple. The two witnesses, uh, Simeon and Anna, have proclaimed who he is. The third witness, the Holy Spirit working through them. We've had the law of the Lord fulfilled. He's been identified, but he's 40 days old. And so then picking up at verse 39, and when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town, Nazareth. This is Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace, God's favor, Karen, that's the Greek, uh, was on him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem 
every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the feast. When they completed the days, as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Supposing him to be in the traveling group, there with a big group that's come down from the north, they went a day's journey. But when they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, when they did this, they did not find him. They returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among, in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. And his mother said to him, child, why have you so treated us? Look, your father and I, distressed, have been searching for you. And he said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that it is necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they did not understand this word that he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus continued to advance in wisdom and in stature and in favor or in literally in grace with God and man. So we're back to something we've already preached about uh, back when we talked about the Annunciation to Mary, the doctrine of the incarnation. Jesus fully human. He's fully God, but he is also fully human. And as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself. The son emptied himself and took on human form. He became one of us totally, fully human. Christ needed to grow up in body, and some of us will say, well, yeah, I'll follow that. He had to grow up, you know, get, get, get bigger. But also, understand this, in heart and mind and in soul and will, one of the early heresies of the church was that, well, Jesus' divine will takes over and kind of guides his human will and it kind of takes over. No, 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 no. He's growing. He's fully human. He's emptied himself. Okay, so he's, he's God, but as fully human to be our mediator. He, he has to grow up. He has to learn. He doesn't know all the answers automatically. He doesn't, he doesn't click in on some heavenly iPhone and get all the answers plugged into his head. No, 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 no. He has to learn this over time. His character develops over time. His will, his heart develops over time. The child, Paedion, he's a little boy. He's a little kid. Verse 40, grew and became strong filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Compare that with our step-up parallelism, remember, with John the Baptist. Same term, uh, the Paedian, uh, the young child John, grew and became strong in spirit. Notice we've got more language and more indication on Jesus. Uh, John's great, but Jesus, yeah, it's a different level. Uh, what is Jesus learning when he's growing up? Well, at the heart of the matter, of course, the law of the Lord, and at the heart of the law of the Lord, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Everything you are, everything you have, totally all in. Love the Lord. And dad, parents, these words I command you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. When you rise in the morning, when you walk along the way, when you lie down for bed at night, in other words, continually, not a five-minute devotion here or there if we have a crisis, and not just like five minutes a day. This is like all day. Parents are supposed to be processing and talking about God and God's way with their children. And we are dealing here with a very health faithful, faithfully healthy family. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Now, under the law, three times a year for the three main, um, you know, 
Holy City uh, feast, uh, the adult males are required under the law to go. But according to this, at least every Passover, Joseph not only went himself, he brought Mary and apparently Jesus with him, like every year for the Passover. And so that, that's, that's, that's special. That's, that, that's not required that he's doing that because what is he teaching Jesus? He's teaching Jesus wisdom and grace in worship and in covenant renewal and in giving. Because what are you doing at the Passover? Well, you're worshiping, you're renewing your covenant commitment personally and as a household to God under the covenant, and you're giving. Notice this. I mean, God forbid somebody who comes to worship and is not gracious before God, right? But Joseph is the opposite of this, and he's fulfilling the law. Listen to the law. Three times a year, all your males, that means grown men, shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Did you hear that? They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. So Jesus is learning gracious giving and worship before the Lord his God. Covenant renewal is a very faithful family, but also a very human family. Anybody ever lost a child temporarily? Well, it happens here, right? The boy Jesus remained in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware. Are you, as a parent, ever unaware of what's going on? <laughs> they, they were. So that's how it, where's Jesus? Where is Jesus? Well, look, a 12-year-old boy, he's probably going to be hanging out. I mean, he lives in little Podunk, Nazareth. The food is so much better in Jerusalem. He's probably just gorging himself on the food in Jerusalem, right? Isn't that what he's doing? No, no, no. Remember, he's, this is a talented boy. The best, I mean, there's virtually no music in, in Nazareth. There's great music in Jerusalem. I mean, you know, the, the, the temple choirs, the, the instruments. Surely he's hanging out, you know, because like young, guy, young folks, they like music, right? So surely he's focusing on the music. That's surely what he's doing. Maybe he's in the outer areas outside the temple, you know, hanging out with some of the music practices. No, no, no. Well, come, come on, he's 12 years old. Friends, and yeah, we got to be honest about it. girls, right? Probably girls, right? He's probably hanging out chasing after girls. He's 12 years old. And I mean, the girls in Jerusalem, they're a lot more sophisticated and better dressed than the, the handful of girls we have in Nazareth, little peasant girls. That's probably what he's impressed with, right? He's probably looking at the stars in Jerusalem, the starlets, right? Is that what he's doing? No. I wonder where he's going to be. You know, we, we, we leave him, you know, we go a day's journey away, we got to hightail it back, and who knows how long we're looking. Maybe it, we could just be one day or a couple days after the, you know, the hightailing it back, and wait a minute. I guess the last place we need to look in Jerusalem, because we looked everywhere else, is uh, like in the court of the Gentiles, over in those benches where like the highfalutin dudes, you know, the great rabbis, they hang out and debate the law. No, seriously, if he's there, he's going to be like probably, we're going to have to look on the outskirts because he's 12 years old. He's, he's not going to embarrass himself. He's probably not trying to kick, he's trying to get not kicked out, you know, so he's probably like hiding in the background. No, no, I don't see him back there. Wait a minute, right, right, right there next to the members of the Sanhedrin. That's him. He's debating with them and teaching them. This is Jesus. Now, this is not a superhero story. This is not a superpower story thing here. Again, he's fully human, okay? But he's on track. And all were astounded by his understanding, linking us back to what? Of course, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Wisdom, kokma, dina, right? All through the Bible, that's what you want. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his root shall bear fruit and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of what? wisdom and understanding all were astounded at his understanding now we are getting ready to come to the first recorded chronological recorded words of jesus in the entire bible so we need to pay attention i'm going to go ahead and cue that up for you that's verse 49 jesus's first recorded words and what are they random 
No, they are centrally a pronouncement of who Jesus is. He understands himself. He's at home with himself in relation to, you want to fill in the blank? I can tell you what the blank is. You ought to know what this is. It's his sonship relationship with God, the Father, the Heavenly Father. This is Jesus at 12. And again, this is Jesus in human development. I know he's the Son of God, but he's also fully human. At 12. It's a pronouncement. A lot of times you'll read books and they'll say, they'll speculate, well, I'm not sure Jesus knew who he was. Maybe he knew by, you know, Holy Week. Maybe he figured it out at the baptism. I think he didn't really, it didn't really hit him until, you know, the cross or something like this. It's like Jesus at 12, God's word through Luke is telling us, knows exactly who he is. Back to verse 48, because 48 and 49, you've got to see them as the center of this passage now. 48 and 49, they go together. They set each other up. They respond to each other. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. And his mother said to him, child, child, why have you treated us so? Look, your father and I, distressed, were searching for you. Does that sound like a, a mad mom? What do you think, an angry mom, an upset, worried mom? Totally. This is the language we're reading here. As she uses the term, we've already been told back a few verses earlier, he's now a pais, okay, he, he's, a, he's a young man, okay, he's a young boy, he's, he's a lad now, okay. She goes back and uses the term technon, my dependent child, child who is dependent on me under my authority. Child, child, he's a 12-year-old boy, he's a pais, okay, child, why have you so treated us, look, your what, what goes in the blank there? Father. Okay, level one, when mama is bringing down the hammer, what does she often say? Your father and I. That means the hammer language is on. But that's actually going to a deeper story here, too. But how, how human is this, right? This is a regular family, right? Jesus growing up in a regular family. Your father and I. Um, this is mother discipline talk, but notice this, your father. And that heads us to verse 49, the center of this passage and the highlight, in a way, of all of Luke chapters 1 and 2, Jesus' self-pronouncement. Why were you searching for me? These are the first words in the Bible from Jesus now. Did you not know that it is necessary for me to be in the house, we have to read in house there, of my father? Your father and I, did you not know it's necessary for me to be in the house of my father? Do you hear that? Father, Father. Let's go back to verse 46 for a moment. After three days they found him. This is a type and a prophecy of the resurrection we're dealing with here. Pick it back up in verse 46. After three days they found him. In God's word through Luke, the whole gospel points to the resurrection and resurrection wisdom and grace. Shout out to Tom Wright, his magnum opus on the resurrection of the Son of God here. Highlights, it deals with this heavily. But I also want to go to this other thing, necessity. In verse 49, in Jesus' first recorded words, did you not know that it is necessary, die? That little verb is a huge verb in Luke's gospel. Runs through multiple times. Let me give you just two other examples, two key links here. Die, same term. When Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi and asks them who they say, you know, I am, Jesus goes on and says this, it is necessary, same verb there, die. It is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and on the third day be raised. There it is, Luke 9, 22. Let me take you to the other key passage. There's a bunch of these, but just to close out. Uh, to the, on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 25 and 26. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe the, all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary, I.D., that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Jesus is already prophesying his atoning death and resurrection when he's 12 with that language, his first recorded words in the New Testament. This is the way of wisdom and grace. Jesus was at home. 
Children, adults, understand this. Jesus was at home with himself. He's got to be at home with himself, with his earthly family, his earthly parents, and with God, his heavenly Father, all three. That's wisdom and grace. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Now, do you hear what I just said? Jesus knows exactly who he is, what he's supposed to do at 12. But in all wisdom and grace, subject to the Father's timing, he goes and what I might say in my human flesh, waste years being a carpenter's apprentice in little podunk Nazareth. But this is wisdom and grace. This is the long game. His parents, his earthly parents, cannot fathom who he is, really, even though they've had the angelic messengers and all that. They cannot fathom what's going on. But he is subject to them, fulfilling the fifth commandment. He's subject to them in wisdom and grace waiting. Now, this is incredible, isn't it? Teenagers, do you hear what I'm saying? This is incredible. Jesus continued to advance in wisdom and stature and in favor of grace with God and men. God and men. Now, now we have that in this final verse. And compared to John the Baptist, what did he do? Well, he went off into the desert until, <laughs> until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So you've got that step up thing. Jesus is giving us the full story, which calls us back finally to where we are for today and for next Sunday. Parent God's child in wisdom and grace, including when mistakes happen. We just read about some mistakes and some miscommunications going on between Mary and Joseph and Jesus when misunderstandings hit and when a child is in a new stage of life. Jesus was definitely at a new stage of life. Your children hit new stages of life. Grow, share, and guard in them in wisdom and grace. If anyone is caught in any transgression, including your own child, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Dads, did you just hear? A spirit of gentleness. Be the adult in the room. Be the adult in the house in wisdom and grace. And finally, children, youth, students, I want you to hear this gospel. There's no thought that can cross your mind. No thought. There's no social media interaction you can have. There's no horrible move you can make. There's no mistake you can make. There's no fear or shame that you're just horrified of. How could this happen? That Jesus cannot deal with, forgive you of, and bring you through. If you will trust in him. There's no crisis too big for the cross of Jesus Christ. You trust him. And as you see your parents walk in faith, turn to them for their shepherding in the way of Jesus. Jesus can forgive everything for those who are of him, who trust in him, who belong to him. And he's infinitely more powerful than the worst things you could ever think or do or say. He's infinitely more powerful. He can deliver you. Trust in him. Call on his name. It's amazing, not just in the high drama of a youth conference or an altar call or a great concert, but I mean in everyday life. Like Jesus went back to live for years in Nazareth, in his little peasant home, in everyday life. He'll be there for you. Jesus can and will be the Lord and Savior of your life, of you, of your soul. So let us then rejoice in Jesus at home with himself as our Savior, with his earthly family, and with God as Father, the one who loved us so much that he gave Jesus to us that you can believe in him and live with him forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, 
Uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.